Darkcast Network. Indie pods with a dark side. Mountain Murders is an Appalachian true crime podcast. Some content may not be suitable for all listeners. Listener discretion is advised. We say fuck a lot. Hey, y'all, welcome back to Mountain Murders. I'm Heather. And I'm a sleepy Dylan. Hey, Dylan, (laughs) how's it going? I'm not sure yet. You're not sure yet. Yeah, it's a dreary day here in WNC. Uh, We slept in, as some people call it. Um, I'll tell you what, every time I don't set alarms, I sleep till like one. Is that good or bad? I don't know, bud. <laughs> I've never, I, I'm not going to say I've never slept in late, but the last few years, I don't typically sleep in late. Okay. As an adult, I tend to get up, you know, the latest I can sleep is like 930. You have this drive, like you have this schedule you need to adhere to. I know. And, and I don't. Well, I like having a bit of a schedule and some routine. Okay. But being around you, I find myself sleeping like today, h- half the day. Yeah. And then it's been very unproductive. But the I only f- thing I've accomplished today is baking a cake. And then the last minute my cake fell. Oh, I'm God. very upset. I, I spent say. a lot of time and attention perfecting this cake, right? I'm not sure your cake's going to make it. Don't, don't say that. I'm, I'm, we'll do everything we it's can to save. It's a beautiful, expensive cake, and then it's fallen. But we're still we're going to salvage the cake. We're still going to have the cake. I don't know. I'm worried about the cake. It's a stout cake. Yeah, well, right Guinness. now it's a flat cake. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you know, all I can think about, I've accomplished some things today. I yeah, you it. helped my cake fall. I was being quiet as a mouse. That's not true. Quiet as You're a like mouse. like a big old buffalo you, stomping through the house. You warned me beforehand to stop, just go over there and get still. And I sat down at the kitchen table, and I stayed there. So, but you know, I kind of am like counting down the time to get back into bed. I think they might call this depression. You had 18 hours <laughs> of sleep, Delon. I, it doesn't matter. We went to bed at like 6.30 last um, night. No, I wasn't that soon. It wasn't that early. Yes, it was. <laughs> oh my God, we there was nothing in, to do. <laughs> we were just watching TV. <laughs> oh my God. You were in bed 18 hours and then earlier <sighs> you had the audacity to say my back hurts. And I'm yeah. like, yeah, because you've... Become one with the bed. In my defense, my back hurt before I went to bed. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> and, Dylan. And, I, and the best thing to help a back hurt is plenty of rest. Dylan, we have two sponsors. We need to give a shout out to our newest patrons. They are so graciously, generously sponsoring today's episode. Jessica and Matt, welcome. 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 Join us. Thank you, Matt and Jessica and all the other new and old patrons. We love you. Patreon is where the fun is at, Dylan. Oh, my gosh. Now that woke me up. Hey. And guess what, Dylan? (laughs) I'm still sleeping. We've been invited back in 2024 as part of the Darkcast Network. Now, see, it's it's not unusual for us to get invited invited somewhere. But to be invited back, now that... That is something to be a, uh, something to behold. But but um, yeah, true. I can't take you anywhere. No, thank you for the Darkcast Network. We love being part of that. There's a bunch of great indie pods over there. I just can't. Oh my gosh. Oh man, so many good ones. And if you are looking for extra content, you want some new podcasts in your life, don't forget to check out the Darkcast Network. Go to darkcastnetwork.com where you can find some of the best darkest shows on the internet yeah do it at the end of this episode beyond the (laughs) rainbow we've got over the fence a true crime podcast and then they were gone fuck that the book of the dead j squared a horror podcast hands off my podcast murder and mimosas conspiring to argue burnt marshmallows a hateful homicide scottish murders Oh, wow. It's a lot of different kinds of murder. Oh, man. There's so many California true crime. There's the Crime Viking, Disturbing Interests podcast, Mission Spooky. 
Oh, boobish boo. The Strange History Podcast. I'm telling you, there's so many good oh ones. My God. So make and sure you check out the Dark Cast Network. We are, again, excited to be part of that motley crew of indie podcasters. And you can find Mountain Murders as well. They, All the murders They over know, there. Dylan. Today we have <laughs> a case that is quite interesting, Dylan. It's one of those cases that... With all the information available and technology, you would think by now it would be solved. Okay. And it's a little frustrating. <sighs> Happens sometimes. And it's one of those cases where I feel like law enforcement had tunnel vision. Kinda, Very early on? Yes. <sighs> and it, and it kind of in, ended up uh, like botching this investigation, if that makes sense. Yeah, and that really can happen. You know, they get, they get a theory developed, which is usually how it works. Prosecution investigators develop a theory, and they, and they try to, you know, suss that out and you know, figure out if that's truly what happened. But if they do truly get a strong conviction or tunnel vision, if you will, early on, it can really wreck an investigation. And sadly, by the end, you'll conclude that's probably what kind of happened. But <laughs> no. let's talk about this case. No. Because it's very intriguing. It's sad. It's tragic. Let's get into it. <laughs> sounds, sounds wonderful. Are you, you ready? Know, let's dive straight in, girlfriend. Suzanne Nahuela Joven was born in Göttingen, Germany. Okay. Or it's Gotten Gottengen or Gottengen. I, we'll just say speak, Germany. I don't speak German. We'll say ger old Germania. Yes. On January 26th of 1977, she was the daughter of American scientists, Dr. Thomas and Donna Joven, who ran the Max Planck Institute for Biochemistry. It's like biophysical chemistry. Thomas was a molecular scientist and Donna was a cell biologist. So they are definitely working above our pay grade, Dawn. Oh, no. I could have been one of those kinds of scientists if I wanted to. You could? Yeah. I'm, and I remember when planking was all the rage. I was doing it, too. Planking? Yeah. <laughs> you look like you've never planked a day in your life. I can plank right now, girlfriend. I will plank right now. I've seen you in the floor trying to do the most basic stretches, mm. right? And yeah, I we have a good that. idea that you can't plank. I can plank. You, well, I'm going to show you when we get you done. You can barely straighten your legs yeah, in front well, of your body. I'm a back sore. I probably shouldn't plank right now, but I can. Okay. Okay. Well, it's worth noting that Max Planck is a prestigious institute in which 18 directors have won Nobel Prizes. Wow. Again, Dylan, I think it's a little above your pay grade. The family resided in a 14th century Bavarian castle. That sounds Now, stupid. can you imagine growing <laughs> up and you're like, oh, yeah, I just live in this 14th century castle over here. Hey, are you the people that live in that Bavarian castle over there? You know, the there? one that was erected in the 1300s? Woo. Yeah. No big deal. Yeah, it's, just, it's drafty. I don't even like it. <sighs> I'm jealous. <laughs> like, my dream is I want to live in a 14th century castle. Thomas told Vanity Fair that his daughter was, quote, an American raised in Germany, for whatever that means. Okay. Well, I mean, you know, has a, that's a, a loaded statement, if you will. How do you think so? I, the, I don't know. <laughs> okay. <laughs> well, well, she enjoyed traveling throughout Europe growing up and visited her grandparents who lived in Mexico. Suzanne was an immensely talented person, both academically and creatively. She spoke four languages fluently. She played cello and piano and sang in a rock band in her high school days. Okay. Educated at a rigorous German school, she began studying Latin in fifth grade and French in the seventh grade. At the Theodore Huss Gymnasium, which was her high school, Suzanne double majored in biology and chemistry. Damn. In high school. What the hell? So I guess I know a little bit about European schools. Oh, do well, you? Well, I know they are, I use the term rigorous, they are a bit more rigorous than American schools. As far as studies go, classes, you are learning, you know, multiple languages. Right. But I was not aware that you majored in something when you were in high school. I mean, that's definitely different than what we do here in the United States. Well, Although I, I think you have like a college preparatory track of classes or you have, hey, I'm maybe not going the college route kind of classes. Yeah, I've voiced this before. I, I think in our education system here in the U.S., well, we could use a lot of help in many areas, actually. And this is also a cultural thing, right? Coming from the parents, coming from your your peers. Um, in Japan, they're very, you know, they leave school and, and it's already a, a longer 
uh, work school day, I'm pretty sure. Then they leave and go to study groups after school for another, you know, two, three, four hours. And it's not something that your friends are going to make fun of you for doing because basically everyone's doing stuff like that. You see what I'm saying? Oh, I see what you're saying. Oh, you see what I'm saying. But I really think uh, not long after uh, elementary school, there should be branches of interest much like college that you go into that may, you know, maybe the, the what you want to be when you grow up doesn't have a whole lot of math and science and it's more hands-on, uh, you know, real world stuff. And, and I think they should be uh, kind of, you know, and I should run the program since I'm so clearly explaining how it should be. Right. So you're saying, you, see, you know what you I'm saying. should be the new appointee to yeah. head of the department of education. Why not? And then I could go around and steal people's or women's clothes at the airport, you know, maybe. Oh, yeah, I forgot. Was that guy in Department of, of Education? He was a department of something. I thought he was part of like a <laughs> nuclear cabinet or something. Who knows? They just have a cabinet full of people who talk about nuclear things. Yeah, you open, open the cabinet it up. And it's just like these dorky guys like, hey, what's up? Hey, what's up? You know, bombs real big and stuff. It's a, just a cabinet of guys because they don't allow women in. Because well, they're like, STEM doesn't allow women. No. Ooh, she's an old school way of thinking. Yeah, you know. Okay, moving along. This is ridiculous. Suzanne's half-sisters graduated from Harvard, but she chose to attend Yale University, which was her mother's alma mater. Suzanne intended to be a science major, but had a change of heart, Dylan. She took a graduate-level cellular biology course uh, her freshman year, but quickly realized she was in over her head. <laughs> a friend said it was one of the few times she ever saw Suzanne's confidence diminish. Well, yeah, who knew that the, what was it? The graduate level cellular biology course. Yeah, who knew that was going to be a tough one? She uh, decided to switch majors to political science and international studies. Yeah, it's a little lighter load, you know, something to pass the time. Despite being incredibly intelligent, friends say Suzanne was anything but stuffy. She was fun loving and would go nuts on the dance floor. Described as, quote, sparkly and cool, she did everything her way. David Bach, another friend, said, quote, she was very traditional and stylish and feminine and very rebellious and liberal. She's all the things. She's all the things. She's fun. She's sparkly. She's smart. And she is traditional, but untraditional, unconventional, and, and whatever that. Unconventional? Unconventional. Okay. I guess. And uh, she's Clearly, just, you did not attend Yale University. Is uh, well, I mean, you could have just said that without giving us this fifteen minutes of oh, you know, with all this talk about college Dylanisms. and molecular Dylanisms that I'm going to attempt to sound smarter than I am. Okay, and uh, like I said, attempt, and uh, yeah, so can um, proceed in your convenience for your forward, proceed in your convenience for forward. <laughs> Let's go. Did you take drugs like, <laughs> before wish. we started? No, this is me sober, honey. Oh. Oh, oh, Lord. That's part of the problem. Looking beyond graduation, Suzanne applied to continue her education in a master's program at either Tufts, Columbia, or Georgetown. All, you know, very just easy schools to get into. Yeah, right? I'm just carrying on, but this is all elite Ivy League. This is big boy shit. Her father had attended Tufts University, so that might have been one of the reasons she chose that school. According to those who knew Suzanne best, she was not really interested in making money, but wanted to help people. Sounds like something a rich person would say. <laughs> just, uh, <laughs> you know, since I don't have to sit around thinking about my electric bill and the water and such, uh, I've decided to create a new type of sale. Therapy. Okay. That made no sense. These are modern day philosophers, folks. Well, you're they're not, not. They're not being drugged down by the you day to day. You are really interrupting my story. Can we get back to this? Thank you. While at Yale, Suzanne participated in the Bach Society Orchestra and co founded the German Club. She also worked at the Davenport Dining Hall. The athletic Susan played squash, she skied and jogged. Interested in social issues, she did volunteer work with a group called Best Buddies. And Best Buddies was a student organization that helped adults with mental disabilities. Oh. Suzanne, it was, I mean, I guess you would think of it almost like a big brother, big sister kind of group. And she was uh, really awesome with her buddy, apparently. Um, Suzanne had developed a, spe uh, a special relationship with her buddy, Lee, 
Uh, they spent hours on the telephone, and Suzanne would bring him to the various Yale like athletic events, games, and to different social outings. She really wanted him to fit in. Now, do you think I would be uh, able to participate in a program like this? You need a buddy. Well, I was going to say. Can I? You're exhausting me. I need a buddy like her. She sounds awesome. She can have you, buddy. She can take me to the athletic events. On December 4th of 1998, Suzanne spent the early evening at Trinity Lutheran Church, which was four blocks from Yale's campus, at a pizza-making party that she had organized. Best Buddies hosted the party, and Suzanne was running the club by the time she was a senior. So she's heading the whole club up, and she's created this pizza party event. Sounds like fun. I want to go. I want to make my own pizza. That was always like such a special treat to get to make your own pizza when you were young. It's right? true. I, and I think uh, I think that I didn't have enough opportunities to make my own pizza as a young child. And I really think that affected me. Everything's about you today, huh? Well, no, it's not. We're talking about Suzanne, Dylan. Well, Suzanne sounds incredible. She just uh, takes over. She has sales at everything. And uh, yeah. She's a lot cooler than you. Well, and, I wouldn't say that. And sparkly. I'm probably more fun at parties. It doesn't sound like it. Around 8.30 p.m., Suzanne left the church after cleaning up. She had borrowed a university vehicle to give attendees a ride home. Once they'd been dropped off, Suzanne parked near her apartment, which was on Park Street. It was an unseasonably warm evening in New Haven. People were walking around and taking in the mild temperatures. From what I understand, Dylan, it was like in the 70s, which New Haven, Connecticut in December. Well, that's got to be abnormal. In like the low 70s. Yeah, that's like unheard of. So people are taking advantage of it. Absolutely. Sometime between 8.30 and 8.50 p.m., a group of friends walked by Suzanne's apartment and she had the window down. I'm assuming because it was such a nice, like a warm evening out. The group invited Suzanne to see a movie. So she's kind of hanging out the window talking to her friends. But she rejects the invitation, telling friends she needed to do some schoolwork. At 9.02 p.m., Suzanne sent an email which was written in German to a friend. In the email, she explained that some GRE study materials she had borrowed from that friend had been loaned to an unnamed person, but Suzanne would have those back soon, and that she planned to leave study materials downstairs in the apartment's lobby for the friend to pick up that evening. She logged off at 9.10 p.m. Dylan, are you familiar with what GRE study materials are? Oh, yeah. I mean... God, if I can, if I can remember all the times I had to come into contact with GRE study materials, oh my God, how much time do you have? Yeah, well, you know, it's like for graduate program, exactly to study to get into. You know, it's like questions that would be asked on the the GRE. Okay, you have to have uh, the GRE for admission to like grad school, business school, law school. It's just kind of, I guess, a an assessment of the skills that are critical for success in those upper, I guess, those upper level fields. So it, it's basically uh, the SATs on steroids, the next level of the SATs, if you will. Right. All so right. she borrowed these materials from a friend. It sounds like she loaned them to someone who maybe was more of an acquaintance, a stranger, someone she didn't know that well, but she would be getting those back soon. Suzanne needed to return the borrowed car keys to Phelps Gate, where a police substation was located on campus. She began walking on campus around 9.15 p.m., bumping into a friend named Peter Stein, who was out for a walk. Suzanne and Peter exchanged a few words. He told the Yale Daily News, quote, She did not mention plans to go anywhere or do anything else afterward. She just said that she was exhausted and looking forward to getting much sleep. Stein noted that Suzanne wasn't carrying a backpack, but was holding a few pieces of white paper in her right hand. But he couldn't tell if it was, uh, you know, handwritten notes, something typed because of the way it was folded. He could just see the outside of the white, you know, nine by 11 and a half typing paper. All he knew was some, some papers Su of some sort. Right. So Suzanne walked at an average pace and seemed normal during their interaction. There was no signs of anxiety or trouble. Just seemed like a completely innocuous interaction, right? It is estimated that Suzanne returned the borrowed keys around 9.25 p.m. Yale was playing Princeton in hockey that evening, which had people on campus. 
A witness leaving the game around 9.30 p.m. spotted Suzanne walking north on College Street. The witness noted a black or Hispanic male in a hoodie just ahead of Suzanne, and a blonde man wearing glasses, nicely dressed, was walking just behind her. Suzanne had worn the same jeans, hiking boots, and a maroon fleece pullover that she had had on earlier that evening at the pizza party. Around 9.55 p.m., a person called 911 to report a woman bleeding at the corner of Edge Hill Road and East Rock Road, nearly two miles from Yale's campus. The neighborhood was affluent with some graduate housing nearby. Minutes later, when law enforcement arrived, they found a female victim fatally stabbed 17 times in the back of her head and neck. Oh, my God. Her throat was slit. She was lying on her stomach, feet in the road, and... The body was in a grassy area kind of between the sidewalk and the street. Uh, Almost like a little greenway buffer. You know, most sidewalks kind of have that. The victim was fully clothed. She was wearing a watch and earrings. She had only a dollar bill crumpled in her pocket. The victim was taken to Yale New Haven Hospital where she was pronounced dead at 1026 p.m. So here we go from just this innocuous, regular evening. No one's noticed anything abnormal to someone being attacked, stabbed multiple times, many, many times, and now she's died. It's it's just crazy how it goes from zero to 60 like that. Well, yeah, and like nobody's expecting that this could happen to them. And it seems no one's really noticed when it actually happened so far. You are correct, Dylan. Amy Chow, who had been Suzanne's freshman roommate, was contacted by law enforcement. Police had entered Suzanne's apartment and began calling every phone number written on a list that was hanging by the phone until Amy answered. Now, at first, she didn't understand what was happening when police said her former roommate had expired. Most of Suzanne's friends had been partying that night. So when another friend explained what expired meant, Amy lost it. Oh, my gosh. And they want her to come down and help identify Suzanne's body. And since she's the first person they were able to reach, she has this horrific task. Oh, my God. So you just go from regular evening to finding out your friend's dead and then wanting you to identify her. That's a tough, that's a tall order. The crime scene was odd. A few things stuck out to investigators. Once a timeline was pieced together, they calculated the distance from where Suzanne was last seen, and there was no way they speculated that she could have walked so far away from campus in such a short period of time. I mean, this is two miles away from campus. They theorized that Suzanne had gotten a ride from someone to the spot. No weapon was recovered from the crime scene. However, the tip of the knife was lodged into Suzanne's body, And would be discovered during the autopsy. That shows you how violent an attack it was. Of the 17 stab wounds, only one was fatal. And they believe, and I think I mentioned this later, but I'll go ahead and mention it. It's like they believe a four and a half to five inch, sort of just like a regular pocket knife made of carbon steel. Okay. So they suspect that's the murder weapon? Yes. Just based on the tip of the knife they found. The location of Suzanne's body was in a well-lit area, and due to the warm evening temperatures, people were out walking their dogs. Windows were open at nearby houses. At least one party was happening in the neighborhood. So it's not like this is a desolate place. I mean, investigators immediately are like, this is a very strange place to commit a murder and dump a body. Yeah, and you would expect that you have a ton of witnesses at least heard something. Uh, All around, because everyone's out enjoying the evening. Windows are up or down, however you want to look at it. People, you know, mingling outside of homes. A fresca bottle was found near Suzanne's body, which had her fingerprints and an unknown palm print on it. Do you remember fresca, Dylan? Yes, I do. It was like a grapefruit-flavored kind of sparkly soda. Yes. Do they even make it anymore? I don't know. Do they make tab anymore? I don't know, but Fresca kind of had a moment, I feel like, in the 90s. Every I, time we watch Scrooged with uh, Bill Murray, he's drinking like, a, I don't know if it's some liquor in Tab is like his drink he drinks. Oh, yeah. And I'm just like, oh, from what I remember, Tab didn't taste that great. Isn't it supposed to be sugar-free or some shit? Tab? Yeah, it was like a, definitely a diet, <sighs> like a diet type of soda. I remember back when my mom did aerobics in like the 80s. 
She was all about the tab. The women, the women folks would drink the tab. After a hard sesh. Of jazzercise. <laughs> yeah. Hey, jazz, don't, uh, jazzercise is like that, buddy. Dude, I'm telling you, I recently tried to do the Jane Fonda workout. Yeah. From back in the day. It's on Prime for free. That I got like five minutes into that and it was kicking my ass. I'm telling you. I was like, there's no way I can fucking do this. I'm way out of shape for this shit. Just put me on a rolling machine for 30 minutes. They used to put us on that jazzercise in gym class, bud. I remember. It's we did. Easy. We sweated to the oldies in gym class. Sure we did. And I remember all the exercises because my mom also had that. You remember that you could do them right now? The VHS. Well, my mom had those tapes. And so when I was a kid, I would sweat to the oldies. Oh, okay. I liked Richard Simmons. I, I know. Into it. Yeah. I know. Always come out, Richard. Show us your face. Okay. So we found this Fresca bottle near Suzanne's body. And also it will be noted later that friends said that was her soda of choice. Fresca. Fresca. A woman who lived in the neighborhood had overheard what she thought was a couple, a man and a woman, arguing moments before Suzanne's body was found. And she thought she heard a woman saying, like, why are you doing this to me? Okay, that could be relevant. Law enforcement began speaking to Suzanne's friends and staff at the school. 22-year-old Roman Caudillo, Suzanne's boyfriend, they learned, had spent the evening in New York City. So he was immediately ruled out as a suspect. Plus, Suzanne's friend said... He was like madly in love with Suzanne. Like there was no doubt in their mind that he had nothing to do with Suzanne's murder. And he actually ended up being so distraught that he left school for like a semester. Oh, wow. Yeah. So it just destroyed him that yeah. something happened to her. Witnesses in the area where Suzanne had been discovered mentioned to law enforcement that they had seen a tan or brown van stopping in the roadway kind of facing east. Other witnesses had seen a man in his late 20s or 30s with blonde hair, athletic build, dark pants, and wearing a green loose-fitting jacket running in the opposite direction from where Suzanne was killed. They said he was, quote, running as if his life depended on it. Oh, so the type of thing that catches your eye. Yes. Okay, not just casually jogging, not moving fast, but look like all out, like you're running away from something. Yes, Law enforcement searched sewers around the crime scene looking for evidence. Roadblocks were set up to interview motorists if they had seen anything out of the ordinary, unusual. I've always wanted to go through one of those. A roadblock? A roadblock where they're looking for something and witnesses and stuff. So you want to go through a roadblock? Well, I want to be the person that gives that information that cracks the case, bud. We, you only want if there's money. No, no that's not true. I want to help. You're just hoping that there's like a reward. Well, I mean, if there is a reward, I mean, I will take it. But, I mean, I'm still going to give this information up. It is said that law enforcement actually did like a search kind of of the crime scene like three different times. Just to make sure they had covered every inch. So, it sounds like that to start out, they're, they're not sure what they're dealing with. But they're trying to uh, drum up some type of a lead. And it seems like they're doing the best they can. Though there were no reports of seeing Suzanne enter a vehicle, it is assumed that she had either forcefully or volunteered to get into one, as it was, again, impossible for her to walk that distance in the given time period. They thought it would be probably less than 30 minutes to walk two miles away from campus. And, you know, she would have to be traveling at a pretty good rate of speed to get to this location. Well, I could walk two miles in 30 minutes, bud. Well, I'm assuming they're, you know, talking about with traffic. I mean, this is a city. Yeah. It's crosswalks. Well, I get it. And uh, she probably, you know, she was, when people did make contact with her on campus there before, you know, this happened, she's probably just seemed rather leisurely. She wasn't just Well, it's definitely ass. less than 30 minutes. I mean, they're saying roughly giving a 30 minute estimate would be kind of generous, but they're like, there's no way we feel like she could have made it there in time. Right, and, and, and that makes sense. And why would she be going in that direction? It's the opposite from her apartment. Right, it sounds There's like she no was no reason to be going there. She was it's hanging out. She a was residential area. Telling she friends. She doesn't know anybody in this area. <laughs> we finished each other's sentences, and that's why I love her. Um, she was. Uh, it sounded like she was kind of just hanging near her room, finishing up some things. So that she'd have absolutely no reason to be walking two miles away from campus. Well, eventually in 2001, a brown van was impounded by the New Haven Police Department as part of the investigation. Yet no link has been confirmed between the van and Suzanne's murder. 
we don't really know what the results of the the van being impounded, what that means. News of the murder spread across campus and New Haven pretty quickly. Now, New Haven is no stranger to crime, Dylan. The neighborhoods surrounding the prestigious university were crime-ridden for years. Seven years before, in 1991, a fourth-generation Yale student named Christian Prince, who was a sophomore lacrosse player, was murdered by the campus. Prince was walking home from a party at the Aurelian Society, which is like a secret society. Thanks, Skull and Bones. Don't tell anybody. When he was shot very close to the president's house, like almost in front of the president's home. Oh, the president of the university? Yeah. Wow. He was the first Yale student killed on campus since the murder of Gary Stein during a robbery near Grove Street Cemetery back in 1974. So although New Haven has its fair share of crime, Dylan, the campus at Yale seems pretty safe, and there aren't a lot of crimes on campus, especially not homicides. You know, the first thing I would do if I was accepted into a secret society, I would go in there and I'd learn all their secrets, and then I'd tell people. That's why you've never been invited to be part of a secret society. I know, but is, is, yeah, you see what a catch-22 that is? Are you making a point of some kind? No. Okay, let's never. get on with our story, Dylan. No, so, um, you know, it seems to be always the case that around these uh, prestigious universities, or any university, really, there's, like, people just waiting all around to take advantage of these young people and students. We've talked about this before, um, that no... It's like it's part of human nature to take advantage of other humans. It's true. Well, I think you get into some of the socioeconomic issues. Right. Um, especially surrounding Yale and New Haven is it's not – you have the haves and the have-nots. You have um, a lot of people there who've got money, who come from money, you know, a lot of students who are fourth, fifth generation, you know, uh, legacy students – And they come from money and have wealthy families. And you get like the professors that are, you know, making decent money and that kind of thing. But then you have the poor people who live in the town that have to work and cater maybe to the rich students in low-paying jobs. They certainly, the university impacts their life in some form or fashion. You know, be it that's where you work, it's where your mom works or something I mean, I think of like Duke University in Durham. That's probably the closest Ivy-ish school to us, right? In Durham, you have the the Duke students, the Duke campus, but then the surrounding areas in Durham are... Violent? Sketchy. Yeah, they say Some that... sketchy it's, neighborhoods down there. It's one of the highest murder rates in the South it, per capita. is in, directly around the school there. So, but, And I think uh, it's a good point in, when you have some Ivy League upper echelon uh, stuff like Yale or Harvard, it's even more starkly contrasted as far as the, the surrounding neighborhood and the student well, Yeah, you've got students who are paying tuition. Their tuition for the semester is more than a family of four is making that lives four streets away. <sighs> so, you know, you get into these issues of the haves and have-nots. Then you have Yale. You know, New Haven is very close to New York City. You get drugs into the area. Well, and, and that's going to be one of the main drivers of violence around a, a university like this is drug and the drug trade. In May of 1991, James Duncan Fleming was arrested for Prince's murder on a tip from Randy Fleming, a non-related friend of James Fleming. So he was arrested, you know, charged. I believe he ended up being charged with the robbery, but maybe not the murder of the student. But again, it's just pointing out that there's not a ton of uh, crime, I guess, on the campus. Uh, Randy Fleming was questioned by police and made these claims under oath. He said that he and James wanted money to attend a rap performance, and James suggested they, quote, stick up a cracker. Oh. James Fleming spotted Prince walking home, demanded his money at gunpoint. Prince handed over his wallet, and after that, James Fleming pistol whipped him and said, quote, I ought to shoot this cracker and then fired his gun, fatally wounding Prince. James Fleming then dropped the wallet in his haste to escape. At James Fleming's trial a year year later, Randy Fleming recanted his original statements, claiming that the police had forced him to lie. 
But the jury convicted James Fleming on conspiracy to rob Prince, acquitted him on the charge of first degree murder, and failed to return a verdict on the charges of felony murder and attempted robbery. Aha. A second jury acquitted James Fleming on the latter two charges in March of 1993, and he was sentenced to nine years in prison. I'm surprised they didn't have to make a now first degree. I get that you got premeditation, all that. I'm going to go kill this person. Maybe you couldn't prove that beyond a reasonable doubt, but felonious murder or whatever they call that, where someone dies during your criminal act, no matter what it is. I don't know how in the world that didn't stick, but I wasn't in the juror room. After Prince's murder, Yale University invested $2 million in infrastructure to update safety on campus. Emergency phones were installed around campus, along with improved lighting. They hired additional university police officers and more like security workers. Four days after Suzanne's murder, a suspect emerged, Dylan. Now, this we've got to talk about this guy. James Vandeveld had been dean of the Saybrook School at Yale, supervising 475 students, and he had taken his job seriously. Though considered socially awkward by friends, Vandeveld tried getting to know his students and forged relationships with them. He was, by the book, no exceptions, leading some students to nickname him Dean Anal. (laughs) <laughs> That's a great nickname. <laughs> Friends who known Vandebeld for years called him Richie Cunningham. He was a true altar boy who was raised in a very staunch Roman Catholic house all around sort of the good guy. So the ev- square, the voice of reason. So even his friends poked fun at how square he is. Yes. Okay. I don't mind people who are square. I don't mind squares either. We need the squares to offset us circles. Why well, no? I'm very by the book. I like things to be a certain way. I've I've heard, and I enjoy structure, and, and you're and you don't. I mean, I I can operate under a, a structural situation. I can do just fine. Is that how we work so well together? Yeah, but I can also fly by the seat of my pants. Because I'm the Richie Cunningham and you're like the, uh, what's his face? Well, see. The Henry Winkler, um, the Fonz. When things fly out of hell or go off the rails or don't go according to plan, it bothers you, right? Because now it's just all out the window. And but Like my cake that I baked. Yeah. It's all fucked up. See, I'm not worried about it. Because I know you'll do something wonderful with it. (laughs) And then when we go to our little dinner party, people will be praising us for bringing the cake. It's much like the podcast. Okay, since we're, let's go ahead and talk about it. But I got to point out something. I found somebody. I found a, a creature in this household who does less for the podcast than Dylan. But yet he seems to get way more praise than I do. And that offending creature is, his name is Rufus. He is our son, our little furry son. And we waited a good solid 10 minutes for him to um, scratch out his little comfy spot on the bed. First, Heather had to get up from her chair, put him on the bed, because his sweater he's wearing right now is way too restrictive for him to try to jump on the bed. And then we had to wait for him to wallow around and scratch out him a little spot, and now he's laying there. Well, I had to put his blankie down. Yeah, I know. The dog has his blankie. Well, why can't I use that 10-minute window to, like, smoke a cigarette or finish a Monster Energy drink? Because you just used the last three hours to do those things. <sighs> okay? That's valid. All right. So, Vandeveld was called the biggest straight arrow at Yale, who discouraged students from drinking and using drugs. In 1997, Vandeveld took a leave of absence from his dean job to work in Italy with naval intelligence. I should mention this guy has security clearance. He's worked as a government contractor. He's in the know about international security issues. So he literally knows things that he can't discuss with the everyday citizen. Yes. More than likely. He returned to Yale in April and then left again to take a job as executive director of the Stanford Asian Pacific Research Center. Nine months into the five-year contract, Vandeveld resigned and decided to return to Yale. California had proven to just be too laid back for the conservative Vandeveld. It was said (laughs) that, you know, he would show up in California to the office, suit, tie. Yeah, ready to go, right? and was just beside himself when the other academics were wearing, 
you know, Hawaiian shirts, yeah, he's shorts. Like, yeah, hey, man. Yeah, yeah dude. he's just like, can't. Oh, sorry I'm late, bro. The, the waves are breaking just he's perfect just out there, Can't do man. it. Can't do oh, it. <laughs> okay, In so that wasn't for him. No, it was just not for him. In September of 1998, Suzanne was one of 169 students who applied for 40 spots in Vandeveld's lecture Strategy and Policy in the Conduct of War Seminar. So he's returned to Yale. He's no longer the dean of the Saybrook School. He's just a, a lecturer now. So you can take his class. So he's just an everyday, ordinary guy now at Yale. Yeah. With security clearance. Teaching. And teaching the stuffy ass lecture. Vandeveld's lectures were wildly popular. In the beginning, Suzanne was eager and enthusiastic. She went out of her way to impress Vandeveld. Halfway through the semester, though, Suzanne's attitude changed. She skipped two field trips in the class, saying she thought they were a waste of time. And by November, the professional relationship between the two had broken down. Suzanne felt Vandeveld wasn't spending enough time helping her with her senior thesis essay. Suzanne told others she had repeatedly tried to meet with Vandeveld to discuss her work, but was rebuffed. She complained that he had shown no interest in her work and that she lacked support for this project. Yet Vandeveld was known to go above and beyond for students. He answered emails within minutes. Most students felt he was more than willing to help them. Most who knew the teacher considered it bizarre that he would go out of his way to ignore Suzanne or avoid Suzanne. Like it just didn't seem like him at all. So it wasn't exclusive to her that like he was helping her and then or then all of a sudden not helping her. He is how he treated all his students. He just helped them. Is like what it, students are saying. So yeah, to hear that he's not helping is the is the aberration. He helps everyone always. Yeah, yes. Okay. Wow, you like that SAT word, y'all. Joven handed in a draft on the paper she is writing on November seventeenth. Then again, before Thanksgiving, she handed in another draft. Suzanne complained to friends that Vandeveld had missed their scheduled meeting for November 30th. But Vandeveld will later say there was no such meeting scheduled. Like he didn't have anything written down in his calendar. He was unaware that there was supposed to be a meeting with her. And as by the book and buttoned up as he is, he would definitely know about if there's supposed to be a meeting. Well, yeah, that's where, you know, it kind of gets, I guess, a little murky with the situation that's going on with the two of them. Because by all accounts, Vandeveld, he seems unaware that there's an issue. Right. And it seems to be a very big issue for her. Yes. By December 1st, Vandeveld told Suzanne that he'd gotten caught up with some other business over the Thanksgiving holiday, but would read her paper that day and meet her on December 2nd, which is the next day, to discuss it. She seemed happy about this, according to the lecturer. Yet, friends say Suzanne was upset about the paper. Suzanne was furious with Vandeveld. She was feeling insecure and unsure of her paper, which was written about Osama bin Laden, by the way. I, I, my dissertation would be very short, but he's bad. He's a bad guy. He's a bad guy. You know, when he's a bad guy towards people we didn't like, we liked him. But when he started being a bad guy towards us, he was just a bad guy. Yeah, I just broke down international political theater, folks, for the lay people. On December 4th, between 4 and 4.30 p.m., Suzanne dropped off another draft and handwritten note to contact her with any edits. So she takes us by Vandeville's office, leaves him this note. But she's uh, it's, all, it's almost like she uh, before this even happens, she already has reservations. She already has an issue, but in her mind, at the very least, that he is treating her some type of way negatively in her mind yes right so it's not it didn't stem from this she was already feeling this way right voicing it to friends anyone who would listen that he's some shit now i'm just breaking it down for the people on the street he's some shit she's trying her best but he won't give her any room to operate in yeah okay sure yeah yeah all right or we could look at it from the point of view <laughs> that for whatever reason she thought maybe she was this shiny student and that she would go into this class, blow him away with her intellect, 
her paper, but he did. which she is didn't. just right up his alley. You know, she's going in there all gung ho thinking like she's queen bee. And then he just is treating her like everybody else. Oh my God. And she's very frustrated. It's the shiny penny syndrome. Because she feels like she's entitled to whatever she's not getting from him. And see, this is exactly, I feel I have had these similar feelings as a husband to you. You know, I come, I bring to the table just a amazing, amazing person, uh, physically, uh, certainly, known as the unit in many circles, M- emotionally, definitely, one of the most romantic, thoughtful guys you will ever meet. Uh, and I just don't feel like I'm getting the recognition in this uh, in, in in this uh, relationship. How are you that making this story about you, bud? Well, I, because see, first of now, all, not right now. Now she's gaslighting. No me. one calls she's you. No one calls you the unit. You're not part you, of the circles. You that call do. yourself the unit. <laughs> you were even trying to get my dad to call you the unit the other day, which he is agreed. really strange. He agreed that I was a unit. He seen me outside. I broke his stick. It was about two inches around. I just snapped it. It was really dead and dry, but I didn't You're tell him. Not that. romantic. You've done nothing in the years that I've known you that even could qualify as romantic. Okay. You remember that time I surprised you with some mushrooms? <laughs> <laughs> Surprise. I'm just kidding. Great. No, romance is not one of my strong suits, but I try. I can't take those. They'll make me sick. Yeah. I Thanks can. for bringing those home. You're welcome. Yeah. Yeah, but so anyway, I can relate with her. Okay, so they're having issues. So it's it's kind of like he said, she said, right? He's it thinking is. things are fine. He's right. treating her like he treats all his students. No big deal. She thinks that he should be paying her more attention. She has higher expectations for their uh, academic relationship. No, kidding aside, uh, that is actually a great view of it. Possibly it is from her. Just what you said. She thought she'd blow him away. She was ready. She's very, you know, very smart and always assailed, always at the top of her class and group. And uh, when she comes in there and she doesn't get what she thinks is the recognition or the the right type of reaction from him, then it's something that she can, really bothers her, right? It permeates throughout the entire relationship. Well, that's what you I. See what I'm that's saying? what I <laughs> am gathering from this. Okay. Situation, and I'm going to go with your viewpoint because you're the one that actually looked at all this stuff. So I'm going to let you. But have yeah, but I'm one. just saying I've known people like Suzanne who were incredibly intelligent, incredibly competitive, and they have a certain expectation, and then they get in a class and they're not the favorite student. Right. They're not, and it does bother them. Right. Because this- they've never been maybe rejected or kind of blown off or dismissed or challenged or told that you could have, probably do a little better than that you know yeah and that makes sense and that doesn't make her a bad person for feeling like that but i think that'd be almost a natural reaction if you are you know in that situation for someone like her vandeveld worked all evening on the fourth around 6 30 p.m a friend popped into the office and invited him to a movie but vandeveld declined he read suzanne's essay and made some notes so he could meet her the next day and give her the notes At some point, he went to the hockey game on campus, but didn't stay long before returning to the office. He claims after that, he went home alone and would have been at home at the time that Suzanne was killed. But there's no one to back up where he was or when he got there. Right. So law enforcement latched on to this information. Um, Once they learned that Suzanne had a strained relationship with her teacher slash, slash lecturer, Um, they started looking into Vandeveld. Law enforcement knew he had trouble in a previous relationship with a local TV anchor. So after they've learned about this relationship, they start looking into him. They learned that he had dated a TV news anchor and that she had reported he was harassing her. Their relationship had been disastrous, according to friends, but Vandeveld denied ever stalking or bothering the woman. Law enforcement asked if Vandeveld ever had affairs with students. There was none of that agreed just about everybody. Like, no one had ever heard anything like that. Not even suspected anything. No, not at all. Completely out of character for him. Again, he's like a very by-the-book kind of guy. There would be no impropriety on his part. So he wouldn't be having, uh, you know, a lot of one-on-one meetings behind closed doors after school hours, things like that. He would. That's not going to happen. Yet law enforcement couldn't shake the theory that Suzanne and her professor had engaged in an affair that had gone wrong. 
And it's, and it, well, it's tied up in a neat bow for them. You see what I'm saying? In, the, in their mind, they're like, this is, we don't have any other leads. And honestly, all they have here is one side of a, you know, a two person relationship. Some are put mild reports that they felt sh that it was strained relationship, if you will. There's not even really strong evidence of that. And even the one side, the professor, he doesn't think anything's wrong. He doesn't think their relationship is strained. So it's really grasping at straws at this point. But it works for them. And this, I think this is a fallacy of the human brain in a certain way. If it answers all the questions that you don't have answers for, or if you can make it, you know, by cherry picking information or, you know, whatever, ignoring that one glaring thing that makes your, uh, blows your point apart, then, uh, yeah, and that's just a, nat I think that's a natural thing. Well, it is. Our brain do. just automatically wants to fill in the blanks. It does. And that is right there is one of the main reasons eyewitness testimony does not work typically, even when people don't have bad intentions. Suzanne was planning to complain about the professor, which police felt was a motive. And the professor was questioned. He was actually interrogated for hours without a lawyer. Vandeveld offered blood samples and permitted law enforcement to search his red Jeep Wrangler and his home. Well, see, he the, offered to take a polygraph, like he's saying, I'll do whatever I need to do to clear my name. Yeah, well, that gives, should uh, score him some points with the investigative team because he's a smart guy. He's been he's been around a lot. He's been he has this high security clearance. He's not uh, dumb enough. I don't think to let you do all these things without knowing full well he has the entire time has the option of seeking counsel and stopping you from doing all these things. I mean, if you're an investigator, someone offers up DNA, lets you search their home, their vehicle, whatever you ask of them, sits down for an interview for hours on end without ever saying, Hey, I think I need to get an attorney. What would that, how would that make you feel as an investigator? Would you be like, well, okay, uh, this guy seems to be uh, forthcoming. And uh, as far as I can tell, he doesn't have anything to hide. Yeah. I mean, I think being willing to work with investigators, you're not calling for an attorney. You're saying I'm an open book, search my home, search my vehicle, search my office. I'll do anything to whatever, help you figure this out. Yeah, whatever you need to right. clear me. Yes. That and doesn't sound like someone who's guilty. Yeah, exactly. It would seem to me like at that point they would chill out on him. So am I right or wrong? Well, by December 9th, in the New Haven Register's front page headline was, quote, Yale teacher grilled in killing. <laughs> the article <laughs> offered just enough information that almost everyone could conclude that the main suspect was James Vandeveld I'll without take... naming names. Yeah. But it's right. everything that you would need to know to point out that he's the suspect. So if you knew of this individual, by the time you read that got done with the article, you would know that they're basically pointing a finger at him. Yes. Okay. Vandeveld, who had graduated from Yale cum laude and won fellowships at Stanford and Harvard, earned a Ph.D. from Tufts, was now considered the prime suspect in the murder of a student. TV reporters, after seeing the headline, found him. He had not even really read the paper. He didn't know what was going on. They shoved a camera in his face and asked him about it. And he replied, I never hurt her, which people took um, to mean something more like that. It was a bizarre response. They're, they're saying that's something a guilty man would say, basically. I never hurt her, yes. They thought that was worded oddly, and it made him seem guilty. Okay. <laughs> I'm, but see, this is a problem with the, not only the press, because they, they have the, oh, what's the right word? They have a, a reason to get this stirred up, and it's all about selling papers. And if creating, it bleeds, it yeah, leads. Sensationalism. But uh, the public, too. And I think it's because at heart, we're all just gossipy. We really are, you know. Even if people are like, oh, I don't like to gossip. Secretly, they want to hear You love you... gossip. Oh, I you're love You're funny. I love it. You're, want... you're like the biggest gossip ever. I'm here If there's for any it. juicy news, oh if I have something juicy to tell you, I can't wait to hear it. It's really funny. Man, even uh, when I used to work at the paper mill, uh, it, it would be something stupid, nothing important, you know, like they changing the schedule or did you hear about such and such? I, I'd love to. I would ask people, have you heard about such and such? And they'd be like, no. And I'd be like, I know I'm the person that knows. And I get to be the first one to tell you. I don't know why. No secrets. No kept secrets. No with secrets. Dylan. But at the same time, I have a vault now. 
You know, if you tell me something and it's truly between just you and me, that's where it'll stay forever. I don't and, or it. unless I until I get home and tell my wife about it. I but say, I feel like wives me, and husbands. I was gonna say you tell me everything. Wives and husbands, I think you have to tell you everything, right? Maybe. In the in the contract, maybe. I don't tell you about that insurance policy I have on you. Well, don't you know what? And don't. Don't okay. because if you were lucky enough to get one on me, I was gonna say I'm just fucked. <laughs> if you, you can drink, afford you those, smoke. If you could afford those premiums, You're wildly Chico, out of shape and unhealthy. Hey, well, hold on a second. Haven't been to the gym in like three years. I'm, I yeah, I'm in the best shape I've been in since you met me. That's why you complain about your back hurts. Well, I'm because you laid in bed for 18 hours. I'm fence strong though. Okay, well they're uh, okay. A witness who had seen Suzanne near Phelps Gate described having seen the blonde man with glasses walking behind. The sharply dressed blonde individual. Yeah, walking behind Suzanne, you know, when she was passed on the street. And once seeing a photograph of Vandeveld, like in the newspaper, the witness thought it's the same man that she had seen walking behind Suzanne. Of course, Carlson reports this. Yale canceled the lecturer's courses for the upcoming spring semester, saying they thought it would be a distraction to have Vandeveld teaching class, even though he had some of the most popular right. lectures on campus. The students were, like, trying hard to get into his classes. And no other students have reported any issue with him, any issue with their interactions. So... That does, and this was the problem here. When you have this type of a cloud of suspicion of either molestation, rape, or murder, I mean, it, it's guilty until proven innocent. Sadly, yeah, I think that does happen to them. Despite fingers pointing at Vandeveld, there was no physical evidence to tie him to the case. Famed criminologist Dr. Henry Lee offered to reconstruct the crime scene, which police accepted but never followed through with. You know, there's been some interesting stuff come out about Mr. Lee. I know. Over the years. That he's maybe been a little shady. Well, I, I always, he was too popular. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. He was too well known to be a doctor in this type of thing. And, and I really think that his ego started getting in his own way. And I always wonder about those guys. These world-renowned experts in blood or whatever. And, and once uh, defense or prosecution teams start paying you tens of thousands of dollars to show up and give testimony. I honestly don't think that should be allowed. Well, a lot of people point to this. They're like, look, he's a renowned forensic scientist, you know, pathologist, what have you. Why would you not take him up on this offer? Well, in, in this case, I would understand and, why people feel like that. But the police really didn't. Uh, even without evidence or motive, the New Haven Police Department continued maintaining that Vandeveld was their top suspect. In 2000, Vandeveld and his supporters encouraged Yale to hire their own private investigators to look into the murder. The investigators pushed law enforcement to test some DNA samples that were taken from Suzanne's fingernails on the left hand. Vandeveld was determined not to be the contributor, though the DNA did belong to a male. Well, there you go. The fingerprints and palm print on the Fresca bottle did not belong to Vandeveld either. One of the private investigators... One of the private investigators called Vandeveld Richard Jewell with a PhD. Okay. Now, if you remember Richard Jewell, Dylan, he was the security officer who discovered the pipe bomb in Atlanta at the, was the 96 Olympics? Yup. And did his job trying to save lives and reported it. And then they suspected that he was responsible and basically ruined this man's life. Yeah, he didn't recover from that. It, it really affected his life in a bad way. Yeah, so Even, they named him, they pointed a finger at him, then Eric Rudolph is the guilty party, but they've essentially ruined Richard Joel's life. And that is what these investigators are saying, is you have James Vandeveld, uh, you know, just a spectacular, uh, you know, guy with what he does in the uh, international political realm and whatever, and you guys are ruining his life. Yeah, you just like Richard him, Jewell. You won't let him teach. You've canceled his classes. You've smeared his name through the mud. Yale has never made its investigation public nor explained the findings or why they've been kept secret from uh, this private investigators they've hired. Uh, wait, what? 
Now, they won't even share with their own private investigators? What I'm saying... Oh, everything, everything the private investigators that, found. Everything that was okay. found through this privately funded private investigators who were hired to come in, look into this murder case, Yale has never made public anything that they found. That doesn't make sense at all. And many say if Yale University wanted Suzanne's murder solved, it would be solved. Well, I just don't understand what what it, that makes it look like you got something to hide. I mean, even if it's something completely unrelated, they discovered that is like a, you know, um, egg on the face of the university, if you will. Uh, you should put you should be forthcoming with everything or omit the one thing that has nothing to do with anything else. I mean, when you don't share, there's no transparency. People automatically assume you have something to hide. Well, it does seem pretty suspicious, and it seems to me like you, you would want that information university. out there. You, your name is being splashed around because you have not solved the murder of one of the students there. It's making people scared. They're afraid to go walking around campus. They don't know what's happening. There's not a lot of information being disseminated as far as this is an isolated incident. This could be happening to other people. Stay safe. You possibly have a professor they're saying that murdered a student. I mean, there's all this PR that's negative. Yeah, so right. you'd think solving this would be a top priority to clear the university, to clear this professor, to make sure people felt safe, right? I mean, there's a lot of reasons why the university should have a vested interest in this. Yeah, even if you can't solve it, even if you don't have that, you know, smoking gun, if you will, on as far as information or evidence goes. Full transparency goes a long way to making people feel comfortable, especially when they're dealing with a, um, a an old storied institution like this. Well, New Haven police reached out to the United States Navy, who was Vandeveld's primary employer at the time of the murder, asking them about revoking his security clearance and terminating contract work with him. See, it's like they're out to destroy this man. I know. However, the Navy reviewed the case against Vandeveld and determined that he could keep his job and his security clearance, that there was not anything they felt that was out of place or kept this man from doing his job. And you could comment way better than I can on this. Does that right there, does that not give you a, a bit of confidence in the professor? Because those security clearances are a pretty big deal. And it doesn't take a whole lot of tomfoolery for you to get yours revoked, right? No, and if I feel like if there was any suspicion that you were involved in a murder and they had any bit of evidence that pointed that direction, the Navy's going to revoke your clearance. Just in case. Especially a top secret clearance. Right. Like They don't mess around with that. So in their view, there's absolutely nothing as far in the case that would lead them to believe there's even a chance that he had something to do with this murder, right? Right, exactly. Um, so, despite little movement in the case, Vandeveld wrote letters to just about everybody he could think of, law enforcement, public officials, you know, government officials, encouraging that law enforcement use some of the advancements in forensics to test the available evidence. Like, hey, you have every year new DNA technologies being developed. Right. Can we not continue trying to test these materials, Right. In 2006, eight years after Suzanne's murder, the case was finally moved to Connecticut's cold case unit. Yet the case was not moved to the state's website, and there was no mention of the reward being offered. So even though the state's supposed to be taking care of this, it doesn't seem like the case, the state's doing anything. Again, it sounds like goes. it's being smothered. By 2007, Suzanne's case was, was moved back to the New Haven Police Department, and four retired detectives were assigned to rework the cold case. Oh, like I know who did Suzanne it. Suzanne Joven's task force. I know who killed her now. Okay. I have a suspicion that it was someone who is the son or daughter, more likely son, because of this type of violence, of someone very, very influential to the university. Maybe one of these legacy students or whatever who has enough clout and power and political power as well in the nation that they could force a cover-up like this. This feels like a cover-up. It truly does. You latch on to this one guy, very scant, no, no evidence to speak of, honestly, just some statements from other people as far as them having a contentious relationship of any sort. And then you, uh, you go after this guy. 
again, no strong evidence. Um, it just basically ruined him, want to ruin him completely. And uh, at the same time, you won't make your findings from private, your private investigators. Uh, you won't make those findings public. Again, no transparency. And then it moves over on the state level. Now the universe out of the university's hands, and it still seems to be stymied. It doesn't seem to be given the attention that, at the very least, the rest of the cases of this sort get. I mean, what's going on here? Well, Dylan, Vandeveld was enrolled in a graduate program um, for journalism, actually, at the Quinnipiac University. And they dismissed him from that program once this information had come out that he was a suspect. And in 2001, he sued that university for wrongfully dismissing him from that program. Um, he settled that lawsuit for $80,000. Noise. He also sued the New Haven Police Department in federal court for violating his civil rights by naming him and um, the public as a suspect while claiming that there were other suspects that existed, but never naming those suspects. Only naming him. Yep. After a long process with some dismissals and then reinstatements of the lawsuit, Vandeveld was finally officially cleared as a suspect in 2013. Too little, too late, I'm sure, for his career. But now, you know, he's married, he has children, he's still working, you know, in and around Washington, D.C., doing that uh, kind of government contract work. Oh, I'm sure that meant a lot to him to have it on, you know, on paper officially. But the funny thing is, they never splashed that all over every paper in sight, that you're officially uh, cleared, or that there's absolutely no evidence against you for this. But they, you know, on the front side, it's everywhere you can look. When Jeffrey you're... Mitchell, who happens to be an old friend of James Vandeveld, uh, released a documentary called The Green Jacket Killer. Um, you can find it on YouTube. I happen to watch it. It's pretty interesting. It's got a lot of information, details. And in this documentary, Mitchell urges the state of Connecticut to finally make good on their decades-long promises to use modern technology on the DNA. Why wouldn't you? I mean, honestly, all these cold cases, I think when every time DNA advances so far, whatever bar you, do, you decide for that, all the evidence should be retested well, especially now that we have familial yeah with the genealogy well that's just a treasure trove databases. of information because then you don't have you know used to you were locked into you you got to make contact with the perpetrator some form fashion even if you don't know it to get a sample get their dna and now with the familia or <laughs> i just feel like i'm saying i'm trying to speak spanish the familia familia you know it's very important the uh Fast and Furious type of family DNA um, that you don't even have to have the perpetrator uh, participate. You know, it could be a suspicious, uh, a suspicious uh, family member of theirs. It could be someone who has no idea about any of this. They're just getting their DNA checked out. Treasure trove of information, certainly. Well, this Green Jacket Killer documentary, Dylan, focuses on a potential suspect that has emerged over the last few years. Tips poured in about this Yale grad student who was a grad student in architecture at the time of Suzanne's murder who had made some strange statements about how he was obsessed with the murder of Suzanne Joven and that he would soon be arrested for the murder. Wow. Okay. The press dubbed this individual as, quote, Billy, which is not his real name. Uh, his real name is actually out there on the interwebs. I won't say it, but this guy, this alleged uh, possible suspect, Billy, um, who also owned a green uh, jacket. There's a photo of him on social media back in the day when he was a Yale student wearing this green baggy jacket. Remember someone, a witness described seeing a man running, wearing a green jacket. Yeah. Yeah. Even the. Uh, sketch composite sketch of this guy in a jacket looks similar to this dude billy yeah. okay well he's died billy um he actually committed suicide on i-95 damn about 10 years ago well that's sad um yeah but friends did say you know he was obsessed with the murder and would talk about it and seemed uh Overly interested. Convinced he was going to be arrested as a suspect. Oh. Yeah. That's interesting. 
Another theory that has surfaced is that Jovan's essay on Osama bin Laden put the young woman in danger. I mean, how good could this essay be, bro? Well, it was written, it would have been written three years before September 11th, 2001. Ooh. And, you know, who knows what she was diving into. I mean, she was saying Osama bin Laden was a huge threat to the United States in this essay. Right. Yeah, and if she was talking about the Afghani-Russian war and all that, and the Mujahideen that we supported and helped create factions of and certainly gave them plenty of equipment and training that we left them with after, you know, that skirmish was over, I mean, I'm sure there's no telling what she was talking about. And then you have uh, her professor, his connections to the naval intelligence, um, who knows? Maybe even uh, unbeknownst to him, he let let it be known up the chain that this, you know, genius student of his has kind of uncovered some stuff or brought some stuff to light. And, and, and I guess your dissertations go into the uh, library of Congress, right? So they're there. Well, this is just her senior thesis. Oh, her senior thesis. Okay. But still, ah, come on, let a man dream. Well, I'm just saying that is a theory that's floated out there. That's... Is that her possible ties, you know, to this international, policy, political science kind of stuff, writing an essay on bin Laden that somehow it could have put her in danger. She could have uncovered something. She could be saying something people didn't approve of. However, others say that doesn't really make sense because if it was a professional hit, it wouldn't be so sloppy as stabbing her 17 times with a tiny, flimsy little knife on a busy street corner. Unless you wanted to look like it wasn't a professional hit, which... In turn, is one of the most professional hits I've ever thought about. Okay, Dylan. Damn, son. Well, we all know if anything, you're just a one hit wonder. So. Well, hey, hey, yeah, you just never know when it's going to come, though, that one hit. See, that, and, that, and that's the like gambling. You're like gambling when you're with me. You know, one day we're going to hit a big baby, real big. Okay, so there are the three potential suspects that have been named in this case. We have the professor who. Obviously, had nothing to do with it. <laughs> that's your that's your professional opinion My about professional the professor. Opinion is he had absolutely nothing to do with it. Yeah, and he, uh, they were obviously railroading him. Honestly, I mean that's what the what well, I got. Well, again, from this. it's like they got tunnel vision. Well, it was almost like uh, on they purpose. They were trying really hard to make this connection and to try to prove that this professor, this lecturer, was having an affair with this student when there was n no one. Who agreed with this? Dude. I mean, friends were saying at the time he that Vandeveld was like trying to meet someone, like he was actively trying to like, meet, you know, he wanted a long term relationship. He was right. like trying to meet someone and date, and that he didn't act at all like someone who was having a sexual affair. Dude, this, this lines up with her being uh, coming upon some knowledge that someone felt like she shouldn't either a have or b publicly declare in any form or fashion. Do you think that theory holds um, more water? Well, I mean, why is it being, like, covered up, basically? That's what it seems like. Well, it does they, they... seem like there's some issue among the police in New Haven. I don't know. Uh, I think... Even with at the state level. Yeah. The way they're treating this case, and especially it's been so long at this point. You know, it's been well over 20 years. Right. And... We have the technology. We can make this happen. Oh, is we this can a $6 million solve, man? Yes, we can Damn. solve this case. Why would you not do everything in your power to solve the case? I think it's a higher likelihood of what I outlined earlier. The person involved, the person or persons involved, um, were from some old, very rich family, and they don't want any of that to come out. So... They publicly latch on to this professor, the flimsiest of connections that you've ever heard of. And, uh, you know, they might not have uh, proved who it was, but they certainly got, especially at the beginning, when something like this happens. The first year or two, it's a really hot-button issue. People are passionate about it, really, you know, still feelings about we need to figure this out. And after they get outside of that, it goes cold and it kind of fades into the background. So, yeah, I think that, that possibly could be what happened. Well, I really hope that Suzanne's family finally gets some answers. Well, see, that's the thing. It just seems like you have 
the answers on a shelf somewhere and someone is just too lazy or too cheap to take the shit and test it. See, that's the thing right there. It lost in all this story and the wonderings and the conversations that could be had are the fit victim and their family. And they certainly deserve answers. And it doesn't matter if those answers, uh, the truth hurts other people. It's the truth. And it should, uh, they deserve it more than anyone. And uh, that's the worst part of this. They just don't know. And uh, I'm afraid they never will know. Well, let's hope that's not the case. And, you know, Suzanne was such a, like, bright, um, smart, just incredibly talented person. And it sounds like she really wanted to make a difference in the world. And you just think about if this hadn't happened, like, where could she be in her life right now? She could literally change. I mean, cellular, cellular biology. I mean, she literally could have changed the world. I mean, that's well, that's considering some that's work. not what she was studying. Well, yeah, but I'm saying, just imagine if she did start studying cellular biology, how smart she was. She was studying political science. Yeah, well, that, but yeah, hey, bro, I know there was some shit with sales early on. National, okay, she might have went back to her first. I love passion. that you go through an entire episode and you still don't even know what you heard. Amazing. Well, I, it takes uh, me amazing. a long time to process it, and I gotta say. Sometimes I just start thinking about, I wonder, you know, things like, I wonder what color blue that shirt was that you described. And I get stuck on stuff like that. But then I move along eventually. And okay, catch well, up. she was studying not science. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Just saying. I mean. Right. Cool. But she could have saved mankind, irregardless. <laughs> <laughs> you never know. At the very least, the world lost a bright, beautiful person. So. And yet you're still here. And, and I'm, people like me are still here. So that's am, what I'm talking about. I it's am taking never, applications for a new podcast partner. No. If there's someone out there who would like to fill Dylan's very small shoes because he has tiny feet. They are small shoes. Uh, just let me know. I don't think I they, cannot continue a professional relationship with this man. Okay. I just don't think they understand. Uh, I'm beginning to understand how a professional relationship deteriorates <laughs> to the point that you don't want to work with someone anymore. I and don't see, want you to grade my paper. And I, don't I don't want you to read my paper. I want you to have nothing to do with my paper. And so. I think everything's fine. So this is how it happens, folks. So if I am mysteriously killed walking down a street or someone's to poison my tall boy beer, uh, well, I think we might know who the perpetrator would be. Yeah. Probably your ex. Probably my ex. She's fucking crazy. And on that note. <laughs> Probably your ex. On that note, I want to thank uh, Matt and Jessica again, our new patrons, sponsors of today's show. Thank you very much to the new and all the old patrons. We love you so much. And thank you to everyone who listens out there every week. You're so special to me. You know, the, in Girl Scouts, they tell you to make new friends, but keep the old. That's right. One is silver, but the other is gold, Dylan. Oh, okay. So stay gold. Both of those are precious. Stay though. gold, friends. Okay, Pony Boy. Thank you. You're welcome. All right. Till next time. Bye. Hey there. Do you like spooky or maybe true crime? Well, on my podcast, Missy Mysteries, you can get a little bit of both. Most weeks, I focus on missing persons and unsolved cases, but some weeks, I have a little bit of paranormal stories or special two-parters with a little bit of true crime and a little bit of paranormal, like the Lizzie Borden case. Check out Missy Mysteries every Wednesday wherever you like to listen to podcasts.